over the next couple of videos, I want to talk about some key terms that show up sometimes in relation to science studies that is good to know about. And so we're going to be doing some comparisons between uh, some of these things. The first thing I want to talk about is the kind of study or the kind of data that you collect from different kinds of study. We already talked about this, and there's two main kinds of study that is used to prove research. The first is correlational, and the second is empirical. And we talked about both of them in our lecture series. The correlational studies are studies like observational studies, archival studies, and things like that, where you just establish relationships between the variables and you cannot imply causation or say that A causes B. You can only say that A is related to B. And there's limitations for that, and there's things you can do to improve the value of those studies, like we already talked about. But uh, there's limitations for that. Watch the video about correlational studies if you want to know more information. Then you have empirical studies, and that is controlled experiments, where you do and you actually establish a comparison between variables where you control what you do, and you have a control group, you have control constants, and that allows you to set up a causal relationships between variables, and you can say that A causes B, or that there is a causation, a cause and effect between the two variables. All right, so that's the first thing I want. Another thing that I wanted to contrast is the idea of numbers of measurements. Sometimes in science you measure things only once, but sometimes you measure them multiple times. And I'm not talking about the thing you do in experiments where you get the average of several uh, uh, measurements or where you um, repeat the experiment several times or you wear a replicator, things like that. That is something else that has to do with improving the validity and the reliability of the experiment. I'm talking about a design that actually makes you repeatedly observe the phenomena that you're talking about. So the best thing to do is look at an example of this. And let's say, for example, you're trying to see if the fertilizer will affect the growth of a plant. So what you can do here is that you can test the plant um, before you give them the fertilizer and then give the fertilizer or not, because that's going to be my control group where I do not give the fertilizer. Then I measured it again to see if there was a change after the fertilizer. So what I did here is that I measured twice. I measured before and I measured after. And then I could give the fertilizer again and measured it again. So you see what I'm talking about? What I'm doing here is repeatedly measuring after repeated experimentations. And that is different from just basically doing the experiment many times or different from a single measure where I don't measure ahead of time. I just get a group and one group I give fertilizer in, and the other group I don't and I just measure them after to see if there's a difference. Now that's a valid way of doing it but this way might provide you more insight into what's, things, what ha what's happening. And you can also do cool things like for example then I can invert. Now I'll give these people fertilizer and that those I won't and then I'll see if the growth is a pattern that similar to the first time that plant got a fertilizer. So there's all cool things you can do with these kinds of experiments. They're called repeated measurement experiments where you measure uh, things many times over time after many repeated treatments. And that allows people to uh, uh, get a better insight into the nature of, of the phenomena that's being studied. So single measured versus repeated measure studies. Not the same thing as replicating or repeating the experiment or getting averages. This has to do with how many times you test and retest people within the same experiment. Another set of key terms that I wanted to differentiate here has to do with the timing of studies. Especially in repeated measure studies when you want to compare patterns that occur across time. Um, there's importance to look at many measurements but sometimes you don't have the time to do it and so you have to do different versions. In this version that you see here, you're following along a person across time. We call it a longitudinal study because you're, you're going long ways across time and you're measuring what's happening to that person across the time. So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to save time. What you end up doing is something similar, but instead of tracking one person across many different ages or getting that baby and tracking him all throughout his childhood, what you do is you get that baby and compare him with a two-year-old baby with a similar four-year-old baby, with a similar six-year-old child, with a similar eight-year-old, and you're doing the same comparison you would have done, but across people at the different ages that you want to look at. That is called a cross-sectional study, where the measurements taken at, are taken one at a time, but at people at different points in time. So 
these are done usually for devel developmental studies when you want to see the changes that occur throughout time. So in biology, for example, you could use this as uh, I'll follow this animal throughout his, his development and see what happens at each stage of his development. Or I get several animals of that kind at different stages of their development and compare them once. You know, so the first version would be the longitudinal study. The section version would be the cross-sectional study. Now, a really cool version puts both of them together in what we call the repeated cross-sectional study. So that's where you get one, let's say one animal, and you observe it at zero, two, six, and eight weeks of life to see the development of the animal across time. But at the same time, you compare that with another animal that is already two, but you also track that animal through six and then eight weeks of time. And then another one, you, you start with a maybe four weeks, or sorry, the six weeks, and you track them until he completes the eight months, and then the other ones you start at the eight months of time. So what you're doing here is that you're, you're doing a longitudinal study and a cross-sectional study at the same time, kind of stacked on top of each other. That's a really cool way of doing it. And each of these studies will give you insight into what's happening across time with a certain phenomenon that you're trying to study. And there's just different ways of collecting information and getting more and learning more about the phenomena. Another set of key terms that I want to differentiate that sometimes shows up in science is the idea of prospective versus retrospective studies. Now, prospective studies is it's what it sounds like. It's talking about the future, your, pers your perspective, what, what's coming f forward. And this is really mostly the most common type of study. It's when you, you said, I'm going to start collecting data from now on and then I'll collect it from here to the future. But sometimes that's limiting because, you know, there's so much data that may have already been collected from the past. So it's good for you to go and do what we call archival research and look at that data. So if you're doing a correlational study, let's say, for example, you're doing a correlational study about the effect of climate on migration patterns of birds. And you already have migration patterns of birds uh, and climate data from many years in the past. Instead of just starting today and moving towards the future and collecting data, you can also look at the retrospective data that's been collected on the past. So retrospective studies look forward on time, where retrospective studies look backwards on time. Whichever way you want to look at it, there are valid ways of collecting information. Of course, when you're doing retrospective studies, you're limited to the, to the extent that you can't collect any new data points. You can only collect what's already been collected. Uh, while prospective studies, you can decide ahead of time what data do I want, and you can make sure that you are collecting all the data that you want. But either way, it's, it, prospective studies, retrospective studies are useful to expand the, the amount of data that you have available to, to see the phenomena that you're trying to study. Another kind of description that I wanted to differentiate and when it comes to science research is the types of data. Well, we talked about this briefly in the first lecture series, but data is basically information that you collect from observations. But there's two types of information. There's qualitative data and there's quantitative data. Qualitative data are descriptive data or data that uses things like adjectives and put things into context. For example, you can say, you know, uh, what color shirt I'm wearing? What is the shape of the shirt that I'm wearing? What is the color of my skin? How how uh, fast can I run uh, in terms of like a descriptive word? Like, oh, he's pretty fast, you know? So anything like that describes the event with words and adjectives would be considered qualitative data. And that's data that's actually very important for science because it gives us information, insight into the phenomena that sometimes numbers don't. But numbers are very important for science because we like to do what's called statistics. And so we need to have quantitative information so we can check that to see if the hypothesis is, is rejected or not. And so quantitative data is very important. Now, quantitative data are things like descriptions that use numerical average data, measurable data, such as, for example, you know, uh, this, th how many people are in, in a society? How long did it took something for for happen? How many, how many chairs are in a room? data that's actual numeric. Now sometimes the data will be numeric, but it will not be continuous. It will just be categories of numbers. One, two, three, four. But sometimes it will be continuous. Science tries to use continuous data as much as possible. And that is the two different kinds of data, and I hope it clarifies for you. Another kind of key term that I want to differentiate is between the types of data collection when it comes to who are you looking at. There's two types of research. One is called ideographic research, and ideographic research means that you're going to be looking at a singular case. 
for a particular event or subject. Case studies are a perfect example of that, and we'll talk about that in a second. But ideographic research, ideographic. What is what? It, what that means is that you're looking at only one person. You're using. You're looking at only one event. Uh, I'm looking at that one time that the sun did that one thing. I'm looking at that one behavior that that animal did to try to understand it. And it's important too because in science sometimes things happen happen very rarely, and it's good for you to collect as much information as you can about that single event. But in science we try to use as much as possible what we call nomothetic research. You know. Nomothetic research is when you compare averages that exist between uh, events. For example, instead of looking at just one event, I'll look at several events and look at what happened on average. So looking at nomothetic research might be better because like I said in science, re replication and repetition are crucial for us to truly understand if there's reliable uh, understanding of that data, of that phenomenon. If you can see it once and you can see it again, it's easier to see the pattern happen. And then you can make predictions and see it again to see if you can actually understand what's happening. But when you do it, look at something ideographically, it limits the amount of, of, of certainty that you're going to have about whether or not you understand what you're looking at. Along the same lines, the number of people that you're looking at is also matters. In things like case studies, for example, it's ideographic because you're only going to be looking at one subject and, and if, or one event and following that event. So, for example, I will do a case about this monkey and its life. So, it's a case study where I explore that one type of thing. For example, I'll do a case study about HIV while there are so many other kinds of RNA viruses. Does talking about HIV by itself tell, makes me understand that virus are all kinds of RNA viruses? No, it's only ideographic. It's only talking about HIV. But... If I want to understand the things more completely, I have to do um, uh, what is called a normative study, where I get many subjects, and that will be a nomothetic uh, data, right? Uh, data that you collect from many people, and you get the norm, and you get the average between many different people. So a case study will be the aggression that one child is displaying. Uh, normative study will be the average aggression displayed by several children. You see the difference? And... Uh, a case study will, get, will yield you ideographic data, and a, a normative study will yield nomothetic data. And one special kind of study is actually something called case series. It's actually very cool because what it is, is, is you look at several case studies at a time, and you're basically looking to compare uh, what exists between different people that are... Uh, that you want to experience. It's very common in medical research when you compare people that have a condition with people that don't have the condition and you do that one person at a time and then you see if there's patterns there. But it's not the same thing as doing a normative study where you uh, sort people into groups and all that kind of stuff. It's more like doing several case studies and then, and then trying to put them together. But regardless which way you, you, you do it, science does any of the options to try to find to get as much information as possible about the event.